It seems like there's more and more news coming out every day about what looks to be the planned structure of the new Ineos uh, front of office staff. Um, and under the guidance of Jim Radcliffe, because uh, I don't think Jim's going to be too hands-on. I think as an owner, he's going to appoint this guy, this guy, this guy, and then he's going to go off, you know, running the fucking the car thing, the the, the main company, he owns Bell staff and a bunch of other gaffes as well. So I think there's going to be a strategic overhaul in that sort of front of office stuff, trying to revolutionise the club's football operations behind the scenes because it's just been something that, you know, okay, so Alex Ferguson oversaw what would essentially be a uh, a club front of office staff when he joined in, in 1986. That was essentially a non-league teams now, right? You know, I, I probably have as many people that work with us obviously not full-time, but at Paddock, as, as Sir Alex did in 1986. So the job and the sport has grown around Sir Alex, where he had his fingers in all of those pies. He was essentially the head of the academy. He was essentially the director of football. He was the manager of the team. He was our head of recruitment. He did all of those things, and he delegated like chief scouts, like his brother, and a couple of other people helped him out with it. But he was probably wearing five or six hats um, at the end of his Manchester United career. Now, when he left... There wasn't the structure in place, and he was replaced with, uh, you know, essentially Ed Woodward, who was kind of doing a lot of that sort of stuff, not to a great uh, degree of success, it must be said. We brought in various different um, people in terms of the scouting and recruitment. Him and Matt Judge had a bit of a hand in it. Latterly, we've seen John Murta get involved, and you know, there has been uh, various people uh, starting to take up those sorts of tasks uh and of course there was you know a de facto head of academy um it was brian mcclair at one point under sir alex but you know sir alex was the guy that was steering the ship from a directoral point of view whether or not he was given that official title or not so what we're about to see under the ineos guidance with them getting the football in control is something that we've we've seen other clubs but we have not actually seen this at manchester united where it's dedicated footballing experts given power to make dedicated football decisions you know and there's going to be a, a focus on really reinforcing and bolstering that um backroom structure something that's hopefully going to enhance united's ability to not just scout top talent but attract retain streamline the financial packages rather than being forced to just dish out fat salaries because it's the only thing that we can offer and we've left it too late in the window we don't have alternate targets if you start working on three or four targets and you go in you know with middling sort of offers one of them is probably going to accept well then you go with that one rather than being forced to put you know 300 400 grand on the table to get a player over the line um and convinced you know hopefully there's strategies to to think about what we've already got in the academy and integrate those youth pro prospects and then begin elevating overall performance standards across the board you know this concerted effort under Sir Jim's leadership, hopefully represents a, a determined step towards modernising the way Manchester United work uh, and hopefully leading a, a promising era of improvement uh, and innovation, which we did used to be known for. You know, I've spoken about this on countless times. Sir Alex Ferguson, um, well, Mal, Mal uh, Bagavan, basically created the sports science revolution and it's never spoken about you know pro zone was effectively derby county were the first team to get it um but it got popularized because of manchester united old trafford was the second place it was installed and it was used to great success in manchester united's treble season the 98 99 season was the first time someone had converted the pictures that you could get from tv uh, well, it wasn't actually the pictures you can get from TV. They converted the, the eight cameras positioned around Old Trafford. They used logic and algorithms to create a 2D picture. And then they had actual analysts code it up for passes and tackles and shots and, and this, that and the other. Manchester United were the first big team to get anywhere near that sort of stuff. And Strikes never gets any credit for that. But that was, you know, we're approaching 25 years ago now for that. So times have to move on.
uh, and they will move on. So let's look at some of the names, some of the faces, and some of the people that uh, we expect are going to be involved. Now, obviously, not all of these have been uh, announced or, or whatever. We're just sort of hoping there's some things click into gear um and let's start with number one someone that i've been on to for absolute years uh, and that is paul mitchell recruitment expertise specialist in recruitment across european clubs one thing that united have really struggled with is like people take the piss out of how much um they value players you get someone like paul mitchell in who's worked at huge clubs to middling clubs to you know, clubs that are, are known for being a, a bridge to somewhere else, to being at the top of the tree. He's got a level of experience at a ton of different clubs, which allows him to truly know the value of a footballer and not have his pants pulled down when he goes into a meeting with someone. Obviously, he's had notable roles at Monaco, um, New York Red Bulls, as well as RB Leipzig, Spurs, Southampton a ton of experience across the gaff initiated the recruitment division uh, at mk dons um and is, is credited with a hell of a lot of genius work uh, including i think um human son is is one of the names that's on his uh, docket so done well there potential role at manchester united would probably be either deputy director of football or literally just head of recruitment. He's got experience in aligning recruitment alongside managerial styles. So that's something where, you know, he can buy players that are going to fit what Ten Hag wants. He might also be someone that gets involved with uh, lining up potential replacements for Ten Hag, whether he goes or not, just having someone ready to rock and roll. Proven track record in talent acquisition. He's got a name that is known um, and his contact book is probably ridiculous across Europe. Um, and he's also, everywhere he's been, there's been a progression of youth into the first team as well. So I think that's uh, a big bonus for him. His Premier League record, um, the key signings he made at Southampton and Tottenham. Bit of a mixed record at Spurs with both successful and unsuccessful deals. Big success, like I said, in, in Human Son, one of the best players I think we've seen in the Premier League. Uh, credited with a lot of the successful signings at Leipzig, players like Schick, Hadara, uh, and Kunku. Um, you know, all of these players have been ended up getting linked with Manchester United or they've eventually had moves elsewhere. Uh, seems to be selective with high quality signings over just getting in whoever. Next up would be Jean-Claude Blanc, probable CEO potential, successful at Juventus in terms of rebuilding and financial reconstruct, uh, reconstruction for them, led uh, Juventus to Serie A dominance because of sustainable uh, financial strategies, instrumental in Juventus owning their stadium and securing financial stability. A very successful tenure at PSG, transforming the club into a global brand, which is probably the thing which I think makes the most sense al uh, aligning to what Manchester United have got. The key deal being that Jordan brand one, which transcended football. I think that was uh, impressive. Uh, Recognised for mad market inventions and brand collaborations. Like I said, that Jordan brand one really did. Like You, you just see fucking kids cutting about Market Street in town and Deansgate wearing Paris Saint-Germain stuff. Why? Jordan. That was why. Because it became a fashion thing rather than just a football club thing. Um, potential role at Manchester United, I think CEO. Uh, seemingly already played a key role in uh, Jim Radcliffe's purchase or you know stake purchase. Um, I think he replaces Richard Arnold. He's obviously got uh, expertise in financial management, debt reconstructuring, marketing strategies. Uh, I believe he's got some uh, experience when it comes to TV rights and innovation in those sorts of things, which I think there's a lot of growth for with United. Uh, and his potential for significant structural changes and certainly brand enhancements. Because I think even though people say, oh, the Glazers done really well, look at the revenue that they've, they've made. Yeah, everyone else's revenue has gone up like, in three four times and ours has gone up like two three times like we've actually not grown anywhere near as much as we should have done uh, in the last 18 years so i think someone that can come in and actually do it from a sports perspective smashes it dan ashworth um this should have been laughed out as a rumor when it happened the fact that it's not makes me think that there might be something in this and everyone's like oh he's got a 12 month notice period at newcastle let's see how that goes down shall we because whether or not there is a 12 month notice period or there isn't a 12 month notice period as a competitor if if united come in for him they're not going to make him work his 12 month notice period and whether this is 
morally right or legally right, I could see him working on gardening leave, right? So I wouldn't worry about it. Anyway, um, he's a very, very, very respected name in English football. Um, ascended from academy roles to sporting and technical director at West Brom. Massive role in establishing technological step-ups uh, for global game recording uh notable signings and integration from west brom and the english fa uh successful spells at brighton how, look how well brighton are uh, yeah and then newcastle has been a big part of their recruitment drives in terms of his role at manchester united um i, I don't know what his official title could be because he's kind of going to sit semi alongside um Paul Mitchell in this, I would think, because they, they do have semi-overlapping roles and responsibilities in this one. But I would think with the recognition he's got from enhancing academies and talent identification, Dan Ashworth might be someone who sits more alongside the identifying talent that we can bring in at that 16 to 18 kind of age range and integrate them into the first team before creating first team players. So I think he's more of a pathway. Um, so maybe he's like, some sort of an academy recruitment or you know academy transition or something along those lines don't know this the the exact title but i can see it being something like that um i, I think his contributions would be in the academy and recruitment side so maybe you have uh paul mitchell looking for your first team and um and dan maybe sits across working alongside Mitchell to identify talent and maybe the first port of call is to go and speak to Dan and say, what have we got in the academy that can do this job? And if he goes, actually, nobody's ready, let's go look at uh, externally. Or this guy needs a little bit of a polish, maybe oversees the loan and the development with him on loan and then bringing him into the first team, something along those lines. Um, so Dave Brailsford. Now, as we've seen, He's not going to be putting the cones out on a Monday morning. That's not what he does. Uh, marginal gains, a pioneer, um, brought in that theory in cycling. Uh, I've seen seemingly tried to translate that into football. It's basically a culture of continual uh, development and improvement, attention to detail. They use a lot of data-driven decisions, uh, trying to create a competitive edge. Big on enhancing player welfare, which is something I'm, I'm a, a big advocate for. I think that Premier League teams, you, know, you, you buy a £100 million player, uh, that is an asset to the business and to the football team. Are you doing enough to look after him? Are you allowing that player to settle in the area? Are you making sure that you know the, the wife or girlfriend that they bring over is going to be happy and settled in the area? Are you making them help make uh, to make good decisions in terms of where they live, what schools their kids go to? You know, he's big on that sort of stuff. Um, very adaptable, very innovative. Um, and he talks a lot about sustaining success. So it's not just about, can we go and win one trophy and then all relax and smoke cigars? It's how can that be repeated and, and, and continually improved upon? And while football and cycling are very distinct, obviously there's a lot of principles in terms of the athleticism that I do cross over. Marginal games can be adapted to suit absolutely anything, um, especially within sport and the unique demands from sport. Um, I think if you embrace the philosophy, United could unlock a new dimension in the performance. Um, and with the, the budget and the money that United have got, United should be looking at being the innovators in this. Why aren't we funding studies at American colleges to, to see what the impact this does why aren't we funding that manchester united should be a global leader in that that place at carrington should be a fucking university should be as many motherfuckers cutting around in lab coats as there is in training kit in my opinion you know let's let's do a uh, qualified studies maybe uh, get a tie up with loughborough get a tie up with an american college get a tie up with you know manchester university whoever it is but conduct experiments rather than just waiting to see what uh, stuff comes out from the, the 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 cutting edge of science or or whatever be the cutting edge what's the impact on traveling the day of a game what's the impact on traveling a day earlier what's the impact on maybe recovery if we fly home immediately from a champions league game or what happens if we stay an extra day and conduct a training session and then fly in the middle of the day where it's not disrupting sleep patterns like do that do science shit. Find out what the actual optimum thing is and get it fucking done. That's what United should be all about. You know, they're, they're, 
one of the most difficult things um, about recovery is sleep. And sleep is one of the most important things. Like, genuinely, sleep does so much, it might as well be a steroid. It's that good for you. Well, why aren't we conducting more and more studies into sleep? What if it was something as simple as when you travel, take the pillow that you take from home. It's got the right scents and smells on there. And the comfort of that on your head might elicit a better sleep than just random ass hotel um, sleeping does. Now, you know that there's uh, your first night sleeping anywhere, you get a bad night's sleep. Did you know that? If you didn't know that, that's, that's fucking, go look it up. I'm not lying to you. And one of the reasons for that is that the human mind thinks this is an unfamiliar place. I'm going to stay half awake. So half of your brain stays awake and your first night sleeping somewhere. What impact does that have on performance? Can we delay our travel? Can we adapt our travel? Can we find a way around that? Is there a way for us to mitigate that? And like I said, something like taking your own pillar, I don't know if that's true, that, that actually impacts something. I'm fucking talking shit. I'm a YouTuber. I'm just throwing it out there. Get some science, guys. Some motherfucker with specs and a clipboard. Get them to study it. That's what that whole entire philosophy should be about. Now, just having the attitude and, and the statement that we saw come out on Friday where we're like, we're not asked about trying to make money here. We want to win trophies. That's a start, right? But deeds, not words. Let's see it happen. Let's see you try and put that shit into performance. Now, there has been some controversy. Cycling is the dirtiest fucking sport in the world. Um, and there was doping controversies when it came to both Team Sky and British Cycling. No charges were found, but there were ethical concerns raised. I know some of you lot in the comments are going to be like, who gives a fuck? Bring 21. Who cares? Ultimately, I personally also believe that football is dirty, but they cover it up. We know that the FA cover up um, failed drug tests for whatever reason. The FA can't say they've got a zero tolerance to drug abuse because they don't, because they will hide it up. You see so many players that are injured for two weeks when they're actually serving a drugs ban. You think, the fat lad's chatting shit again. You go Google it. The fucking information is completely out there. It is happening on a regular fucking basis. Now, why are they covering up all this? I don't know. Go and have a look what happened in the treble season and the charges that were brought against Juventus. The 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 EPO usage that was rampant in Italy in the late 90s. It's out there. I, I, I'm just amazed. It's No one's been caught. And what's quite funny is that I'm a UFC fan, I'm an MMA fan. MMA and the UFC went through what's known as the steroid era. Well, they drug tested during that era, and the drug tests were as stringent as the Premier Leagues currently are right now. And I say the Premier Leagues, that's not casting aspersions at the Premier League in particular. UEFA, all of Europe, the Champions League and all of the drug testing conducted in Europe is the same level of drug testing that was done in MMA slash UFC when it was called the steroid era. It's a piss test. It's not consistent um, blood taken over a certain period of time so you can notice changes in the, the structure of it. It's just a, a very simple piss test. And people that know how to beat those piss tests call it an intelligence test. If you want more info on, on that sort of stuff, then I would say go and check out... Um, the fantastic documentary Icarus that's on Netflix and you'll learn a hell of a lot. And if you've not seen that, you're about to have your mind blown clean off because it's absolutely sensational. Um, but yes, so that, there you go. There's a, there's a lot of food for thought there. Plenty of food for thought in, in multiple different areas actually, but there's a hell of a lot um, to digest with all of those. Um, and it'd be interesting to see just how and when this all begins to shake out, isn't it? Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Get your comments and questions and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Uh, and let's start a, a thread it. A thread it? A Reddit thread. A thread it. Yeah, it should be a thread it, shouldn't it? A thread on Reddit. Thread it. Fuck it. Right, let's start a thread it on Reddit. Um, I'm talking about Icarus. So once everyone's seen it, head over there. And I'll see you in a bit. Laters. Hey, thank you for watching the video. If you are new around these parts, then don't forget to subscribe. My channel is proudly supported by my community on Patreon. If you'd like to get a little bit of extra content, a Discord group, meetups, five-a-side games, weekly podcasts, behind the scenes, and even an occasional bit of transfer news as and when I get it, 
then for the price of a pint, you can show your appreciation for the content that we make and get some goodies for doing so as well. Check the link in the description or click the button right here. You'll also find all of my socials here too if you want to follow me on any of those platforms. Nice one.